everyone to this afternoon's session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. I'm Eric Arneson of George Washington University, and on behalf of Christian Osterman, my co-chair, and myself, we are pleased to host this webinar on historian David Reynolds' new book, Island Stories, An Unconventional History of Britain, published by Basic Books. The Washington History Seminar is the joint project of two institutions, the History and Public Policy Program of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and the National History Center of the American Historical Association. Behind the scenes, our thanks to Rachel Wheatley of the National History Center and Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center. These folks are the ones who do the heavy lifting that make these webinars possible. And our thanks as well to the LePage Center for History and the Public Interest and the George Washington Department of History for their financial support. And of course, thanks to our individual and anonymous donors. Before we get going, I just want to say for those watching on Facebook, for those who would like to submit anonymously, please email your questions to rwrweekly uh, at historians.org, or you can private message the National History Center on Facebook. We're delighted to have with us this afternoon, or rather for this individual late in the evening, uh, David Reynolds, who is Emeritus Professor of International History at Cambridge University. He's the prize-winning author of 12 books, including Command of History on how Winston Churchill wrote his war memoirs and The Long Shadow, The Great War and the 20th Century. He's also made more than a dozen historical documentaries for the BBC, many of which are available on Netflix. And after David speaks, we'll have two discussants this afternoon. The first is Laura Mayhall of Catholic University. The second is Dane Kennedy of George Washington University. And I'll introduce them after David's remarks. And with that, I will turn over the screen to Professor David Reynolds. David. Well, thank you, Eric. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. It's a pleasure to be doing this uh, event across the Atlantic. And I'm grateful to you all for organizing it and to those who've uh, uh, signed in on Zoom for uh, wanting to participate. So I'm talking about a book called Island Stories. If you haven't seen it, I think that's the, uh, the image of it. Not sure you can see it, but um, anyway, it's uh, a kind of crazy book. It's called, the subtitle is called An Unconventional History of Britain. And it's an overview, if you like, a kind of overview of British history in 200 or so pages. Um, as I say, rather crazy. Why did I stick my neck out? Two reasons, I think. Uh, first of all, it was provoked by political events, in particular by something called the Brexit debate, which you may have vaguely heard of uh, across the Atlantic amid your other interests and concerns over the last few years. Um, but what concerned me there was what I felt was the use and abuse of British history in that debate. And in particular, two strands that worried me, the simplification of the history of Britain to what was called our island story, our island story, which is uh, the title, which is the title of a, a best-selling uh, book written uh, more than a hundred years ago, though still in print, um, by a, uh, uh, a popular writer called Henrietta Marshall. And this was used a lot by people like David Cameron and Michael Gove, conservative uh, um, political leaders, during the run-up to the Brexit debate as the kind of story they wanted to tell about uh, Britain's history about our island. Bear in mind, there wasn't much reference to another island which was part of the United Kingdom, the island of Ireland. So I was concerned about those oversimplifications. I was also concerned about the way that again and again in modern Britain, the story keeps coming back to 1940, as Churchill called it, uh, the finest hour, and the feeling that somehow this was a story, this was the high point of Britain's story, the reference point for the present as well as the past and the future. So those were my, if you like, political provocations into writing this book. The more professional one was a concern that our discipline has become more and more specialized and less and less ready to think about big pictures. And this is a concern I know uh, for the American Historical Association as well. Um, 
In other words, we've got more and more good history being done on areas that weren't thought of almost as history 20 or 30 years ago. But uh, we're losing the ability to connect those up into a larger narrative. And so the writing of the big story is often going to popularize as uh, people who are not uh, really digging into the new research, but are actually uh, recycling secondary material. So those were the two prods that I had. And what I want to do briefly now is to tell you a little bit about the, um, the, uh, the parts of this, uh, this book. Um, the four chapters because it it breaks down into uh, a chapter called Decline, another called Europe, uh, another called Britain, and then finally Empire. And these were four grand narratives that I thought needed to be addressed that were being often simplified, uh, mistakenly so, and also, these are grand narratives that are often in separate silos in the writing of British history. And again, you can think about this for any other country you want, French history, American history, whatever, that there isn't a lot of talking across these sub-disciplines. Sub so, um, if I start with the decline, I just summarize briefly what I'm saying there. Um, one of the obsessions of, of the Brexiteers was this sense that Britain had or was perceived to have declined in past uh, decades. Um, maybe not actually, but um, for many Brexiteers, this was a failure of willpower, that the country could make itself great again, a phrase used by Margaret Thatcher as early as her first election campaign in 1950, um, by an exercise of willpower. And what I wanted to say in the, that chapter about decline was that this is, I think, a mistaken notion. What we should be surprised about is not the position Britain is in in the world now, but what's historically remarkable is the position it got to in the middle of the 19th century. In other words, rise is surprising decline or relative decline is certainly not. Um, so the, the point here is that it's really a, um, it was an accident of history, if you like, that the uh, uh, two small islands off the northwest coast of, of Europe gained a position where in the middle of the, uh, the 19th century, they were uh, producing 50% um, of the world's iron and steel, uh, generating 40% of world trade in manufactured goods, even though they had 2% of the world's population. This was not a position which was tenable indefinitely. It grew out of Britain's development of uh, sea power in the, uh, from the 15th, uh, 15th, 16th century onwards. Uh, it reflected the importance of trade to an importing nation, the buildup of a navy to support the merchant fleet, and then the opportunities that came from uh, informal empire, the networks of trade, formal empire of colonies that were gained by force uh, in various wars. Um, some of those areas of the world were lost. Um, we won't get into details about uh, the unfortunate events of 1776, but you know a large number of uh, parts of the world were held on to India, which mattered a great deal. So as I say, that is a position that is not tenable in the long term. Why? Because other countries, first of all, caught up with Britain's industrial development and technologies and indeed uh, surpassed them. Also because bigger states with more resources and population uh, uh, develop their own power, Russia, uh, the United States, particularly after the crisis of the Union was settled and the country held together. And also, of course, Germany's bid for power in the 20th century on the continent of Europe. 
And also what made a big difference was the changing technology of warfare. Britain had this advantage of being an island nation. It had a degree of protection afforded by the channel, what Shakespeare called our moat defensive, and that mattered in an era of sea power. But once air power had developed, the channel was no longer a barrier. Uh, indeed, Winston Churchill said in 1934, we're no longer an island. Um, and of course, then after the Second World War, you have the development of nu uh, nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles, all of which make the country much more vulnerable. But what I argue is that as the island nation, the island position became less important for Britain's security, and Britain had to look much more to alliances, so the island position became even more important for Britain's sense of identity, security, identity. The uh, memory or the public memory of 1940, the channel, the White Cliffs of Dover, Britain standing alone against Hitler, became a very important part of Britain's identity. So this is a story then of, um, uh, 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 this is the story of the first chapter, if you like, or the first main chapter. Decline to the position of, of uh, um, significance, but much less importance that it, Britain holds now is not surprising. What was surprising and untenable in the long term was Britain's rise. Moving on then to the, um, the next chapter, the, this is one, the theme here is really uh, about Europe and the relationship with Europe. And although it's called an unconventional history of Britain, uh, one of the things that's unconventional is I don't really start in um, uh, the Neolithic beginnings or the prehistoric beginnings or indeed in Rome. I start with 1066 because that does seem to me a significant uh, moment in British history, English history particularly, when the long period over several centuries of Norse uh, incursions into England and Britain uh, from Scandinavia come to an end with the Battle of Stamford Bridge, the last big Norman, Norse, Norse invasion. But then the ba a battle three weeks later, more famous, the Battle of Hastings, establishes the Norman conquest, Brit England looking and turning south across the channel. And it's important to remember if we think of England's relations with Europe, that the channel for four centuries, from 1066 to uh, the 1450s, was not a barrier, but a bridge between two parts of the King of England's or the monarchs of England's domains in England and in France, not just Normandy, but in the uh, Middle Ages in the 14th century, large parts of Western France as well. And so it's in, that's important, I think, if we're thinking about that story of the channel and its sense of being a barrier. It certainly wasn't for the medieval kings, nor was it for successive English um, monarchs. Yes, certainly in the Reformation, England pulled up the drawbridge, if you like. There was a sense of uh, threat from the uh, counter-reformation uh, on the continent of Europe to the Protestant Reformation in England. Um, but in order to defend against that, it wasn't simply a matter of uh, the navy, the armada threat being repulsed by the navy. It was also about preemption, about uh, English monarchs developing alliances with other friendly powers on the continent to avoid any large hostile bloc developing on the continent of Europe that could threaten the English coast. That was, if you like, the first line of defense was across the channel, not at the White Cliffs of Dover. And we see this as a pattern right through the um, early modern and, and uh, modern period of, of, of English history, the successive battles that were fought on the continent, uh, battles that became famous as part of our island story. So for example, the Battle of Blenheim in 1704 is an alliance with Habsburgs against 
uh, the French against Louis XIV fought on the Danube by a, a British army and an army of British and, and, and German mercenaries and so on. Similarly, the Battle of Waterloo celebrated still in uh, you know, a great railway station in London and all the rest of it. That is a victory by uh, a British army with the Dutch, Dutch support with the Prussians uh, against Napoleon. So building alliances always mattered for the security of our island. Uh, and the same is true in the 20th century, except that now the threat from Germany, particularly in the Second World War, involved a different set of alliances, not so much European, but extra European, particularly with the United States, also with the Soviet Union. And it's at that point that in a way, Britain loses touch with that sense of the importance of the continental commitment for a crucial period of time. And what I argue in the book is that the, one of the big failures of modern British diplomacy was not to take seriously the movement for Western European integration in the 1950s. If Britain had got involved in that, it, there was a serious chance that it could have shaped the European community in a way that was much less inimical to British interests, more like a free trade area that, that what British wanted, less protectionist, less focus on agriculture as the French wanted. But that was a missed opportunity and one that in the end proved quite significant because when Britain finally woke up to the significance of what was happening on the continent, it was too late to join the European community come into existence and the British had to join late into an organization in which they were never comfortable. Now, it seems to me that Brexit is in some ways misunderstood, I think, because the turn to Europe never really undermined that sense of identity, of special identity that the British had. It was, it should have been understood as another tactic for avoiding a bloc developing on the continent of Europe that was a threat to British life. Um, similarly, now that Britain has moved out of the European Union, the same issue will still be there. How do you deal with groupings that form on the continent that are threatening to British interests, if not hostile to them. And that is going to be obviously a lot harder for a country that is um, uh, one against 27 rather than a member of an organization of 28. And one against, uh, in a world where uh, major powers, uh, particularly the United States and China, are lining up against, uh, against each other. So that story of Britain and Europe is an ongoing story in which the island identity uh, is, is in strain, in tension with the need for continental commitments to keep some kind of balance of power uh, on the continent, or at least to avoid a hostile bloc. If I turn now to my four, my next chapter, which is um, uh, about Britain, there we've got uh, a story which I think is, um, again, uh, there's something special, different to say, I think, in the book, and this is what I was trying to, trying to do. Um, the, the story is one, uh, as you know, the, well, let me put it this way, the, official name of the country to which I belong is the, um, the United Kingdom. But nobody here, as far as I know, calls themselves a Ukrainian. And uh, the term UK only caught on really from the 1970s. The, for much of the recent history of this country, the term Britain and England were used interchangeably, certainly by the English, certainly by people of Churchill's uh, generation. And um, there's, that's not entirely surprising because in many ways, the whole project of the United Kingdom has been a story 
of the expansion of the English state. Starting with medieval kings, the English crown, <coughs> dealing with unruly and problematic neighbors on its uh, borders, and uh, gradually bringing them under its control. In the case of the Welsh from the 1530s, brought under English governance, the Scots much more difficult <coughs> on and off seven centuries of uh, periodic wars between England and Scotland in which the English could not, the Scots couldn't keep the English out, but I think you could say the, the, the English couldn't keep the Scots down. And out of this emerged a compromise, first of all the Union of Crowns in 1603, and then the Union of the Parliaments in 1707, the Act of Union. Uh, provoked, uh, prompted by a, a French war, a war against the Catholic uh, French. In the case of Ireland, um, the uh, Act of Union does not come until 1800 and 1801, again provoked by a war with France, in this case French invasions in the 1790s. So this attempt of, if you like, English control over the islands um, has uh, eventually a degree of success up to a point. And the success is embodied in this shared project of the British Empire, the British Empire, in which the Scots and the Irish uh, play a significant part, way above their um, percentage of the total population. On the other hand, it's a relationship that is, is unequal. The Scots hold their own within the Union. They still retain their own, part, uh, their own uh, church. They still retain their own legal system. There is already a relatively developed commercial economy, intellectual life, uh, precocious early industrial revolution, uh, which means that, as I say, it can hold its own. Ireland becomes, as it uh, has tended to be most of the time, a colony of, of England, ruled by significantly a viceroy, which was the term used for colonial governors. And of course, um, the country is used largely as a, uh, a, a, um, an agrarian, um, uh, it, it's kept in a relatively agrarian state, uh, providing produce and providing labor for the English and Scottish economies. Um, the Union itself, the whole United Kingdom, comes under enormous strain in the 1910s. And it's important to say that the Union as a whole, because we often think of the story as simply about England and Ireland, the wars of, of uh, 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 the Easter Rising in Ireland, the Irish War of Independence, the Civil War. <coughs> But there's a very strong home rule movement in Scotland before the Second, First World War. <coughs> there's significant anti-English feeling in Wales. And what holds Britain together, in other words, the island of Britain together, is actually the, the, the war. The uh, First World War gives a new sense of Britishness, of a British project in Wales and Scotland. Nationalist movements die down. And that is reinforced, that sense of unity is reinforced by another war in 1939 to 45. The story in Ireland, of course, is very different. Um, uh, uh, the War of Independence, the Civil War in the 1910s and early 20s. Um, and then after the, uh, the, the uh, in a divided Ireland between the, the Republic and the, 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 the North. Um, still remaining part of the United Kingdom. And then, of course, the opening up of the Troubles from the 1960s to the 1990s, which um, were, if you like, in the if you like, conventional English way, tolerated as a level of disturbance and killing main radar, if you like, of London. Uh, what is the death toll, maybe three and a half thousand people over a long period of time, militarized border, a uh, huge amount of suffering, something that was in, regarded as acceptable in order to maintain the, the what had been intended to be a, a temporary partition of, of the country. What I try and emphasize in the book is that I think the 
what happened in the 1990s, which hugely important, late 1990s, what I call a kind of millennium settlement, meaning by that two things, the Good Friday Agreement in Ireland, which um, uh, brought, not exactly immediately, but to an end, gradually the troubles, created a new relationship between Dublin, Belfast and London, opened up the border and opened up a whole lot of new dynamics on the island of Ireland very positively. At the same time, the English government conceded referenda to uh, Wales and Scotland, which produced their own parliaments in, uh, in Cardiff and in, in Edinburgh. So what you were seeing in the late 1990s, around the turn of the century, was a sense of a much looser United Kingdom. Uh, one that was devolving power, was going its own way, sort of a lot more wriggle room, if you like. <clears throat> and that has been thrown into serious question by Brexit. Brexit was an English project uh, by English Tories, um, predominantly English Tories, led by them anyway, with little thought for the implications of the union. Uh, and the fact that, of course, the Scots and the Northern Irish voted to stay in the European Union, although it doesn't count constitutionally, uh, matters politically because of the tensions with London. And those tensions have been increased in the last few months by the very different ways the, the governments of London, in London, Dub, um, uh, Belfast, uh, Edinburgh and Cardiff have handled coronavirus and the restrictions and so on. So what you're seeing now is in many ways a, uh, a dis, disunited kingdom, a one in which there are growing tensions between the different parts of that union. And then finally, and then I'll, I'll pass over to um, comments and questions, um, the question of the empire. The empire was clearly uh, enormously important for Britain punching above its weight in its heyday. Um, but the narrative here, the rather comfortable narrative of our island story, is that somehow we made the empire, and then when it was ready, when it had grown up, we let it go. We give, gave it its own freedoms uh, on the English or British model. And what I think is really important is to emphasize the ways in which the empire made us as well as we made the empire. This is now, I think, increasingly a theme of imperial historians, that empire is not just an add-on part of uh, the British uh, saga. It's an essential part of understanding Britain. Um, two examples of this. Um, which I think two examples which question the sort of celebratory narrative about the uh, empire story. One of them is the way, and again, this will be very familiar to people in the United States, the way in which slavery has been brought back into the story of the empire. Uh, the British like to celebrate um, the era of sea power um, of the, uh, the English uh, riding the waves, Britannia ruling the waves, all the rest of it. Sea power is, the age of sea power is inseparable from the age of uh, slave power. Um, simply to say Britain, uh, to celebrate Britain's roles in the uh, abolition of the slave trade in say 1807, the ab abolition of slavery itself in Britain and the British Empire in 1833, is to miss the point that Britain profited massively from the institution of slavery before it got round to uh, abolishing them. Half of all the Africans carried into uh, to Atlantic slavery in the 18th century were carried in British ships. It was an enormously profitable business. Um, slavery in the Caribbean grew sugar, um, tobacco, crops that were integral to the consumer boom, the consumer revolution that paved the way for English industrialization, British industrialization. Even when, even when um, uh, slavery was abolished in the British Empire. Uh, the cotton industry, the cotton textile industry in Britain depended on uh, American cotton from the South for its, um, its, uh, its raw materials. Um, 
So this is a story which has yet to be woven into the narrative of British history. And it isn't um, sufficient simply to mention a few, uh, if you like, token black figures at various points. But the story needs to be much more, uh, the story of, of, of slavery needs to be woven, as I say, right much, much more into the tapestry of, of English history and the comfortable uh, narrative that we've produced. The other one that I want to mention briefly, which again has been neglected, is the scale of um, immigration from the former empire since 1945. Uh, again, uh, told perhaps in, in, in uh, occasional stories, both about um, immigration, uh, the Windrush uh, from uh, the vessel that brought the first substantial immigration from the Caribbean in the 1940s, or racist backlashes in Ock Powell and so on. But the story is one of a deliberate use by the British government of uh, labor from the colonies without coming to terms with the social implications of using that labor of the people who came and how they related to the, the country and the inhabitants. And that carries on to the present day, uh, that we see that um, now the ethnic complexion of the country is significantly different from what it was in the 1960s or even 1980s. Uh, if you take the, the uh, 10 yearly census, um, where people are asked to self-identify their ethnic group, 1981, 94% uh, of the population said they were, they considered themselves white. In 2011, the figure had dropped from 94% to 86%. And it's estimated that by 2050, whites, so-called, uh, will be about 66% of the population, the UK population, two-thirds. The shift in the United States, of course, is much bigger and much faster, will be much faster than that demographically. But the changing face of Britain requires a new understanding about Britishness, what it means to be British with, for people who have been born here, grown up here, but come bring to the sense of Britishness a different sense of heritages from abroad. And that is a whole story again, that has got to be written into our narrative of British history and was neglected uh, in the debates about immigration, the very crude debates about immigration in the Brexit referendum. So those, if you like, are the four big strands that I've tried to carry through in, in my book. Um, and I stuck my neck out, but I wanted to, for the reasons I mentioned at the beginning, and now I'm sticking my neck out even further and inviting some comments from Laura and Dane, I think, who, Eric, you're going to introduce them now, is that right? That is right. Thanks so much, David. Um, our next speaker is Laura Mayhall, who is an associate professor of history at Catholic University in Washington, DC. She's the author of The Militant Suffrage Movement, Citizenship and Resistance in Britain, 1860 to 1930. 30, published by Oxford in 2003, and she's co-editor of Women's Suffrage in the British Empire, Citizenship, Nation, and Race, published by Rutledge in 2000. She's currently working on a book entitled Aristocracy Must Advertise, Rebranding Privilege in Britain, 1880 to 1950. Laura. Thank you, Eric, and uh, thank you, David, for engaging with us today. And I wanted to start by saying that I had purchased this book well before I was invited to talk today. I've been designing a freshman seminar course on Brexit, and I was lo looking for a book that approached the topic from the long durée and explained the historical contexts of the Leave vote in 2016. And I was especially intrigued by the book's argument that, that Brexiteers use history to make their arguments, but it's bad history, right? And you argue that Britain needs a new set of narratives to tell its stories, one that acknowledges how temporary its greatness was, 
how interconnected with Europe it has always been, and how complex its history is both internally and with its empire. And these are all significant points that are developed in what you have uh, rightly, I think, characterized as the siloed scholarship on Britain over the last generation, and it's beautifully synthesized here in the book. And a question I would pose my students from the start would be, what is the role of historical explanation in motivating political behavior? Because I want to believe that correcting the historical record means that voters make more responsible decisions. But I also believe that people are motivated by structures of feeling that don't necessarily map onto historically accurate narratives. And there may not be a way to address that through historical means. So if you'll humor me, David, uh, I'd like to ask a few questions that I would pose in my course mm -hmm. based on the narratives you've outlined here. Mm. Uh, because you've taken on a lot of issues, it's a, you know, it's a thousand years, you've drawn from an impressive body of scholarship, but there are areas where, were I teaching your book, I would want to ask my students to dig a little deeper. So, of course, I would like to start with a question of audience. Uh, one of the ways to read the book, and I think it's one of the ways you intend us to read it, is as an engagement with Americans who love Britain but cannot understand why so many Britons voted leave in 2016. Implied in the introduction and stated pretty clearly in the conclusion, I'll quote the last sentence of the book, the saga of Brexit may also offer lessons for other nations that are captivated by the vision of making themselves great again. Could you draw out some of those lessons for us, for, for Americans from this book? Uh, yes, okay. Um, the, the British story is obviously one where there is a heavy burden of empire, uh, a word which uh, in the United States has been for a long time a word that didn't need to be used about the American experience. Uh, empires were what you got away from in 1776. Empires were what the Europeans did to the rest of the world, the kind of Franklin Roosevelt era sort of uh, ideology. Um, the United States was not uh, an imperial power. And um, whether or not you use the word empire hegemon or whatever it is, uh, it seems to me that you know, debates in the American historical profession in the last 20 or 30 years have um, uh, you know, acknowledged the sense that although the American experience is different, there is that uh, same sense of a country that has asserted its power both over in this case, native inhabitants, uh, and also over uh, enforced labor brought to the United States. And then also has exercised its power in parts of the world, whether you're talking about the Philippines, um, Latin America, and so on, um, which have shown um, tendencies which are not dissimilar to the way the French or the British behave themselves in uh, in their own parts of the world. So that um, what I'm asking is, if you like, questions or I'm, I'm talking about issues which I think are familiar parts of the uh, American historical profession. Um, and I think the other thing I want to say, rather than get into that detail anymore, is to, is to say, the, the, one of the questions I've really wrestled with, and I'm still wrestling with, and, and parenthetically, part of the fun of, for me, writing any book is that you address some questions, you just create other questions which you need to answer. Um, and um, it's always work in progress. But I have, I've, I'm conscious that as historians, I mean, we're, you know, sort of Monday morning quarterbacks, we could always criticize what governments are doing and so on. That's our privilege, we sit there. If I'm a politician, I'm having to make statements about my country in ways that appeal to a wider audience, people who do not have history PhDs, 
but in which I use the past to make people feel proud about their present and um, hopeful about their future. Um, it's, it's very difficult to do a public narrative of one's country, which is constantly self-flagellating. And the implication of my book at times, as I read it, it could be, you know, I mean, how could a government own up to all those, those problems, all those crimes, all the rest of it? And so I think the, the thing I still am wrestling with is almost the question for any government in any country and any historical profession, how do we act in a way which can, contributes to national self-awareness without creating a total sense of national self-denigration? So I've kind of gone a long way from your question, but um, I, I hope I've uh, you know, circumnavigated it in, in some way. Yes, I mean, and certainly you're, you suggest in the conclusion of the book that there could be some sort of truth and reconciliation commission, right? Uh, well, dealing well, yes, with you know, I mean, I was playing with ideas there. The, the last chapter, I mean, I mentioned the four main chapters, which were about the history. <clears throat> the, the, the chapters one and six of Island Stories are really about Brexit and <clears throat> the debate. And the last chapter in particular, the end of the last chapter is really, <clears throat> if you like, almost thinking aloud. Um, I have rewritten certain parts of that. Uh, well, the book was published in the UK. It's been published in the United States. I'm bringing out a paperback in the U UK in a, a few weeks time. And in each case, the last parts of the book have been rewritten because my, my ideas are changing. Also, I'm thinking about things differently, slightly because of COVID and so on. So, um, you know, it's in some ways, it's a, a book with Central, the central pillars of it are fought through the four main chapters and the outer chapter or the last chapter is more like a blog and it's, it's a strange piece of work in that sense um thank you um so and actually i wanted to talk a little bit about that last chapter yeah. because in it you both walk us through the political craziness that leads up to uh, brexit and its aftermath and you also, as I just suggested, lay out some of the implications of your argument for where we go next. And um, I was particularly interested in the section of that chapter that is entitled History, Trauma, and Opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that's where you highlight, and I quote, Britain's complex about the two world wars, uh, which is, a, a, as you argue, a really pressing part of understanding Brexit. And I, you know, anyone who's, taught the Second World War in Britain, as I have completely agreed. It's a complex. It's absolutely a complex. Um, but I have to say, when I think of history and trauma in the British context, I think first of the legacy of empire. And by that, I mean specifically the loss of empire. Would you agree that that's part of the trauma here? Um, not, I think, explicitly and um, self-consciously um, in that you don't find, I think even Brexiteers sort of saying, we should have the empire back. What they want is that sense of greatness that came with the empire and indeed would not have existed without it. Um, and part of what I think is, um, is, is problematic about the sort of the, the Brexit, if you like, I'm simplifying it, Brexit view of history, is that feeling that greatness was um, a function of willpower and ambition and energy. Um, the kind of things that I quote from some of the speeches in the early, uh, the first chapter about decline, that what we can, the way we can get over this problem is by a new exercise of willpower. We need to believe in ourselves. We need to um, break the Suez syndrome, the reference to 1956. You know, we, we kind of wimped out, we lost our nerve. Um, and that for me isn't, isn't uh, that doesn't, isn't, isn't correct answer. What they don't understand is that the greatness that they aspire to in that sense of Britain being heeded as 
a leading power was dependent on the fact that the country could punch above its weight because of all those external um, uh, possessions and powers and influence that were assembled in the age of empire. Greatness goes with all empire. And um, so if you like, it's not a yearning for empire, but it's a yearning for the benefits understood in this way of empire that made Britain great. Yes, but I, and I would just want to push this a little bit because it seems to me that one of the benefits of empire is also um, is a, a, a cruise to whiteness. Yes. And this is obviously a debate that we're having in the United yeah. States about Black Lives Matter. And I know you're having it in Britain as well with statues to mm. slave traders being torn down. Um, which actually kind of gives me hope that the public does have a sense of what Britain's history is, mm. um, if they're going to go and tear those statues down. Um, but it seems to me that what the trauma is, is really the loss of the white man's world. Yes. And that what it does is it engenders a kind of victimization on the part, or a sense of victimization. And this is what I was getting at when I was mentioning structures of feeling. Um, that you have, I mean, Bill Schwartz, calls it a kind of ethnic populism. We might call it white supremacy, but there's a kind of transferred onto the European relationship. I mean, would you agree, is that a fair way to characterize that? Uh, the, the loss of empire gets transferred onto the European relationship. In, in what sense do you mean? Well, Sorry. I mean, it, it, that, that whole argument about we have to get out of Europe so we can be great again. Yeah, in this respect, I guess I would say that one of the things I was a little surprised not to see as much of in the book are a couple of figures that I would have put in there in terms of redressing the historical balance. Um, you mentioned Enoch Powell a couple of times. You never mentioned Oswald Mosley. And it just seems to me that there's another narrative here of um, a kind of populism a kind of, that's very much rooted in whiteness, that's very English, that is very much a part of this story. And um, how would you see that playing a role in rectifying the historical narrative? Yes, well, I certainly think that the, um, you know, the, the going with that sense of the loss of imperial greatness is the sense is a sense for many people of a world in which somehow whiteness was axiomatic, a country that was you know in which whiteness was axiomatic. And one of the things that I tried to emphasize in the chapter on empire, then this stuff on immigration, is really that the country's identity has now changed fundamentally demographically in the same way as the United States. You know, you can't change what the United States is going to be like by 2040. Whatever walls are put up by Donald Trump, whatever railing by Brexiteers are done about like, immigration and so on, um, Britain's going to be a different kind of country, people's sense of identity. I'm fascinated with my own students. You know, I've got, you know, I've had conversations with several of, of them the last year or so who come from, um, you know, who have, uh, I think both in two cases, white Scottish fathers and mothers that were part of the Asian diaspora, that probably the families got out either in that generation or one before uh, from East Africa because of Idi Amin and so on. And these two, these young people have, you know, as, as British as I am in terms of you know, where they were born, what the legal position is, but they have a different sense of their heritage and roots. And I think that that's an essential part of trying to understand a changing identity of the country. And there is no, I see very little sense of that happening in, in, in my country at all. Um, in terms of, Europe, the point you make about this sort of, um, you know, transfer of the angst, yeah, I mean, Europe became, because we joined late, because we didn't fit in, uh, because it ran against the grain of the sort of the white cliffs of Dover and the finest hour, for all these sorts of reasons, 
plus some you know pretty fancy <coughs> and problematic politics in in 2016 for all those reasons we got got out um but um europe became a sort of bogeyman um the brexit project was never thought through uh, i don't think really leave had any serious expectation that they would win certainly there was no planning for the for, for, for what was involved in leaving the European Union yeah. by either David Cameron or the leavers, Boris Johnson. So it's all been made up ever since. Um, <coughs> it's improvisation. And much of it is about, um, is simply about slogans. And just going back, this is parenthetical, but going back to what you were saying about the, you know, the uses and abuses of history and whether people will learn from, from history if we get the right history, quote unquote, um, I was struck how much history is, was used in the Brexit debate, not, uh, you know, it really as simply almost rhetorical tropes um, uh, or um, illustrations sort of pulled out of popular history to make a political point. But there was no serious attempt to argue historically, in fact, by either side. And that was one of the things that, again, was impoverished. So I am although I've written this book because I would like people to, to, to think about history more um, intelligently as I see it, I don't have much hope that it's going to fundamentally change politics because I don't think that's how politicians use history, sadly. Well, and that actually leads to my last question because I wanted to ask, is it bad history that the Brexiteers peddled or were they simply lying? And I'm thinking here of those buses going around with the, uh, we send the EU 350 million yeah. pounds a week, let's fund the NHS instead, or of Boris Johnson's journalistic expose on the threat posed by the European Union to the survival of the prawn cocktail crisp, right? <laughs> yes. um, and here I find the argument that Fenton O'Toole makes in The Politics of Pain really compelling because he's saying that for Brexiteers, their hatred of the European Union has more to do with its restraints on buccaneering capitalism and their right to free themselves from the obligations of nation citizenship and taxation than it does with returning to national sovereignty. So I suppose the question put succinctly would be, is, is Jacob Rees-Mogg bad historian or gaslighting opportunist? I think there was the, the answer is more, is more to do with opportunism. I mean, certainly in Johnson's case, uh, Rees Mogg's case, there was um, uh, Brexit was a, an opportunity for a whole lot of people. So there's certainly a kind of neoliberal uh, deregulation um, brigade that have latched onto it. It's not clear that Johnson necessarily supports all of that. Um, I, I mean, if you ask my personal opinion, I see him as David Cameron said in his memoirs, as a man who, who saw an opportunity and went with it um, and could have gone in some ways either way. Um, but um, uh, I think the, the what's, what's striking about this is, and I'm turning your question, but <coughs> is that a country that has had on the whole a very uh, placid 20th century, uh, well, no, second half of the 20th century and beginning of the 21st century, suddenly went through the most amazing period of almost self, you know, some people would say self-harm, self-mutilation, but it was a self-induced catastrophe that nobody really wanted to develop in this sort of way. Um, uh, and one of the things that has been so fascinating for the outside world in almost a voyeuristic way is just how incredibly the British messed it up, you know. And so that in that situation, all sorts of people have seized their advantages in all sorts of ways. And although my book was more focusing more on the way that the uh, Brexiteers used it, you have to say that the way that the Remainers made their case was um, politically naive uh, in not appreciating the, the challenges that Lee was going to make, 
um, and also um, never really tried to make out a case for the European Union in a really positive sense, which is another, which feeds into my argument that, that we never really wanted to be in as a sense of identity. This was part of the sort of tactic of saying, well, if it's there, we can't let it grow up without us. We need to be able to influence it and so on. So this is not a story of, uh, 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 of uh, uh, that is, I think, flattering to the politicians on either side. And it's a kind of um, shock to a lot of people, not least myself, just how stupid a sensible country could, could you know, behave, <laughs> stupidly behave. Thank you. Um, I'll turn it over to Eric. Thanks very much, Laura. Um, I am now happy to introduce Dane Kennedy, who is the Elmer Lewis Kaiser Professor in the Department of History at the George Washington University. Uh, he is the author of some six books, the most recent being The Imperial History Wars, Debating the British Empire, published in 2018, Decolonization, A Very Short History, 2016, and The Last Blank Spaces, Exploring Africa and Australia from 2013. He's also the editor or co-editor of three other books. Uh, he is now the former director of the American Historical Association's National History Center. And with that, Dane, screen is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Eric, and thank you, David. Uh, <coughs> Let me just first say, I thought this was a, a really good book. I, it's, it's engagingly written and accessible to non-specialists, but at the same time doesn't uh, surrender historical specificity and nuance. And, and that's a very hard balance to achieve. And then added to that, uh, the fact that it, uh, it speaks to the present crisis that Britain is facing, which is uh, is very troubling. Um, I, I'm not going to spend too much time because I want to leave some time for, for, for uh, uh, viewers to ask questions as well. One of the things that struck me reading the book was similar to what uh, Laura mentioned, and that is uh, in your chapter on empire. I am an imperial historian, of course. Uh, I was a bit surprised that you didn't spend much attention or give any attention really uh, to, to the loss of empire. Now, part of this has to do obviously with the fact that as you do say in, in the chapter, I mean, the British empire was a work in progress. It involved different dimensions. There were really in fact different empires at play. And the one part that seems to me to have figured prominently in maybe not the Brexit campaign so much, but immediately afterwards as those who didn't expect to win won and had to figure out how in the hell they're going to create a, a, a new world outside of, outside of the EU, was this notion of the Anglosphere, which clearly echoed back to, to Greater Britain and to this notion of a white man's world, as, as Laura uh, mentioned. Now, you do say something about this. I'm, I'm wondering if, if you feel that this was just all rhetoric for the Brexiteers or whether there was some hope, at least in the first few years after the, the election, that they might, in fact, recreate some version of this, of this world uh, that had been lost. Well, uh, as you know, the um, you know better than I do, the the this whole notion of the Anglosphere goes back to, for example, Joseph Chamberlain at the beginning of the 20th century. The notion of of using the um, the colonies of British stock, as uh, you might say, <coughs> to uh, uh, bring them closer to the mother country, um, to strengthen the weary Titan as it's facing new foes in uh, in the or challenges from America, Japan, China, Russia, and so on, uh, and Germany. Um, the, as to where it's, uh, what, what it, how it figured in the Brexit debate, um, I think it was, it was always a rather empty um, notion because Continental, uh, the European community is, European Union is Britain's overwhelmingly major trading partner. And that 
any you know increased trade with Australia or Canada or whatever um, is not going to make a fundamental difference to the trading relationship that matters centrally. Um, furthermore, uh, if you think about the way that we joined the European, as it was, economic community eventually in 1973, it was by pretty brutally severing economic ties with some of those countries in the Anglosphere. And the Australians and New Zealanders particularly aggrieved at the way that they were basically told, you know, uh, you know, we'll make some efforts to try and you know, maintain the trading connections, New Zealand, lamb, things like this, but basically you're on your own. And so the idea that, and, and they did, they got on with it. I mean, the Australians created a whole lot of new trading relationships across the, uh, you know, the Pacific and so on, China, India, and so on. Um, so the idea that, um, as, as some Brexiteers you know, wrote about it, um, well, now we can, um, once we've left the European Union, we can pick up where we were so you know, rudely interrupted in the 1970s and resume all those natural friendships with the English speaking world was, I think, nonsensical. Um, uh, you know, we dumped them and it's not likely that they would uh, want to rechange change all, all over again their trading relationships and their, uh, their sense of identity um, to pick it all up. So the Anglosphere, I think, had a um, was a uh, was was something that it, if you like, it was um, it was picked up from. It had resonances from the past, and there were often references to Joseph Chamberlain. But it seemed to me that they were almost it was almost like a little bit of um, window dressing on something that didn't have a great deal of, of historical substance. Um, <coughs> Where I also talk about the Anglosphere is, of course, in the notion of a special relationship with the United States, which has been, if you like, um, the, insofar as there's been a, a, a guiding light of British uh, foreign policy since the Second World War, that's been the one that mattered. And indeed, I argue in the book that in many ways, the, the stimulus for Britain joining the European community in 19 uh, or pushing it to start making applications in the 1960s was because of the fear that um, now that the six had got back together and was the European economic community was taking off there was a danger that the United States would take the six seriously as its natural European partner and interlocutor and the special relationship would be marginalized so in other words we were joining Europe to keep the Americans on side, that part of the Anglosphere on side. So I think that um, the the Anglosphere, in a broad sense, was um, was was a another of these, if you like, rhetorical devices that sounded good, but was not, I think, <laughs> didn't have a great deal of substance to it. Okay. But it reflected, just to go back to something you said, Laura said that it reflected that sort of the strand of um, the empire which people felt most comfortable with, with which was the sense of our kin across the sea, the British, the greater British world. The part that was more problematic morally, um, well, even more problematic morally, was what uh, John Seeley called the Oriental Empire, India in particular, China, uh, the parts of China in our, infor our informal trading network, which were um uh the part that the british were um did not feel uh so comfortable with though they were very happy to to make use of its benefits not least because of that issue of race yeah yeah um somewhat along these lines you've you've done a lot of work on um winston churchill and uh, here is a figure who uh, clearly had personal connections in terms of the Anglosphere with an American mother and a British father, uh, someone who recognized the importance of maintaining that association, that connection. Um, 
and someone who promoted uh, a notion of a kind of Anglosphere and some of his historical work. I'm wondering if you could sort of reflect a bit on what sort of responsibility he might hold in terms of the trajectory of, of Britain in the 20th century in this relationship. Yes, I mean, Churchill's legacy is a complicated one, and it's, it's one of the areas that's been most simplified, I think. I mean, Churchill is certainly a believer in Britain having to play a role in the European balance of power. Um, and not allowing that to get out of Britain's control. Contrary to the image of Churchill in 1940, you know, uh, trumpeting Britain alone, Churchill always believes that it's important to have allies. Um, he's not, uh, he, you know, he doesn't imagine that Britain can take on the world alone. Mm -hmm. It's a manager of alliances. It's just that the alliance he ends up in in, in 19, from 1940, because of the fall of France, is an alliance in which he's, you know, from 41 anyway, he's bound to be, he's going to be the junior partner to the two big powers, the United States and the Soviet Union. Churchill's attitude to the empire, um, he believes that Britain should hold on to India. Um, he, ne he didn't see India again for after, I think, 1897. Um, uh, he, his memory is very much that of a young subaltern. Although he romanticizes the English speaking peoples, he's never, I think, he never visited Australia or New Zealand. <laughs> um, it's particularly the United States. Churchill is a great wordsmith. So these phrases like English speaking peoples, um, you know, take on a, a sort of magical power. Um, uh, Churchill is ambivalent about the European Union. He is a uh, Far sight, a pioneeringly far-sighted advocate of European integration in the sense of bringing France and Germany together. And he says this, <coughs> it's absolutely important in 1946, you know, a year after the war is over, that France and Germany should make peace. Um, but he's very ambivalent about where exactly Britain is going to fit into this. Is, is it really for them rather than us? And he certainly wants to have his cake and eat it in the sense that he has this notion of three circles that Britain's involved in. Um, uh, the um, the uh, uh, Europe, it's yes, it's part of Europe in certain ways, but it's also part of the empire, it's part of the English speaking world. And it, these are circles that Britain can kind of somehow mysteriously float around in between and, and you know, is never tied into any of them. Um, which is very much the notion that the British wanted to play, you know, all through the, um, the late 20th century, um, rather than making a very clear commitment to one particular sense of identity. The other aspect of Churchill, which figures in my book, is I think my concern about, if you like, what I call the Churchill industry. I mean, Churchill was an amazing character, and he is... Um, He's damaged, I think, by the way that he is created often now and in, turned into almost one two dimensional icon, you know, the bulldog figure and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. The man's endlessly fascinating and always surprising. And I'm thinking about him again at the moment and things that I'm writing about. Um, but he has been stereotyped by, well, to some extent by himself because he very deliberately shaped his. Um, marked his stamp on the, the Second World War by writing six volumes of memoirs. Um, but then there's been an authorised biography, and uh, there's been companion volumes, there's been movies, there's been films. You know, Churchill is the figure of British history, of 20th century British history, that stands out globally. Mm -hmm. And that is partly because of his you know, the, the, his very striking talents and skills, but it's also because of that, that industry, which is another way in which we have become, you know, tied to a romanticized vision of, of, of the past and of 1940 as our, our finest hour. Right. So, so this may be, uh, to follow up from what you've just said to some degree, um, this may be a rather US-centric question, but uh, Churchill himself had this vision of, three sort of intersecting circles, right? There's Europe, there's Britain and its empire, and there's the US. And I'm wondering if you had more space and more time in this book, would you have 
had in addition to the chapters on the United Kingdom, on Europe, and on empire, a chapter on the United States as a separate and distinct uh, dimension of this interaction, at least in the 20th century. Well, I could have done, but I think that what I, I felt was that um, it, it made in some ways, it made more sense to try and think about the United States within the framework of empire, because the, if you like, one of the legacies of empire that's enormously important, and Churchill you know, picked this up, was, you know, the fact that the United States and Britain spoke the same language, more or less, in the same way as it mattered, you know, as one of the legacies of empire, that um, one of the biggest speakers of English in the world is I India, the lingua franca of, of India. Those two things have been enormously important. And one of the reasons why Britain, if you like, still figures in terms of its international soft power is the pervasiveness of the English language, which is not um, a, um, no longer, because of Britain itself, because of its, if you like, ex-colonies that use it. Um, and it seems to me that um, part of the way in which the British thought about the United States, and I think certainly Churchill did, was essentially a, um, you know, if you put it in this kind of language, it was a, um, a, 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 a former child that had grown up but now recognized its, you know, its, its, um, its, its, its links and its identity with the parental country, the mother country or whatever it was. And that was how he somehow imagined this kind of coming together. Um, so, um, so to answer your question and again, where it goes back to also what um, Laura was asking about with regard to um, empire and greatness, I think that rolling up the United States in this way is a little more instructive um, than having a separate chapter on the United States, rolling it up into the legacies of empire. Because one of the things that this book is, you know, its, its strength and its weakness is that it's essentially an extended essay. And I think if I added more chapters, it would cover more ground in some ways it would deal with more nuances but whatever uh, punch it has or doesn't have it would lose uh, by being longer um, so that would be my justification I think and the other thing I feel very strongly about writing any history book is that I am never I've one of my words I really hate in 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 sort of my lexicon is the word definitive I don't believe any book any history book is definitive, it mm -hmm. shouldn't be. Because the whole point is, if you look at the same evidence as I look, look at it, we can argue about how we interpret it, but you will see it differently from me. Laura will see it differently from me. That's mm -hmm. the point of our discipline. That's mm -hmm. why it's endlessly fun and instructive. And so what I try, I'm trying to write, I think in all the books I've written, and certainly in this one, is it's an invitation to argument and debate, um, rather than closing things down. So this is why I think when I'm very happy to be involved in this kind of seminar, because it's this sense, okay, here's something, here are some ideas of, of mine. You know, what do you think? How would you respond? What would you do with your students? And you know, what that's that's exactly what we should be doing in a profession. It's opening up the debate, not closing it down. Okay. Okay. I, I have just one one final uh question yeah. for you. It 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 sort of circles back to something that Laura addressed as well. Uh, and and it and it has to do with you, you, what is in some ways I think quite interesting and important and distinctive about this book is that it's an attempt to sort of not just talk about the past to give an interpretation of, of British history, but to do so in the context of contemporary issues and to reflect upon the present. Mm -hmm. And I want to read a passage for you from uh, near the end of your book, which I found very striking. You say, perhaps the gross political mismanagement of Brexit will make it harder to luxuriate in the glories of the past. The country's soft power has relied on a reputation for stability, prudence, and common sense, whereas the Brexit mess prompted phrases like political farce and banana republic, to mention only the more polite examples. 
what I found striking in reading that passage was that if you s struck out Brexit and put in Trump, it would be entirely apt and appropriate, right? And so um, my question for you has to do with to what degree do you think, and I know you're, I, I'm asking you to speak here not as a historian, but rather as someone who's reflecting on contemporary affairs, to what degree you think current crisis in Britain and the crisis in America are driven by similar factors that don't have anything to do with the distinctive history of Britain itself? Yes, I mean, I think that the one that seems to me a kind of common feature is uh, the the sense that an identity which was apparently quite clear to the majority of the population is now disappearing before their eyes and in the united states that's a trajectory that you know i mean is different it has a different set of roots because of the, the predominance of slavery within the country. But it also has to do with changes from the 1960s, Lyndon Johnson's Immigration Act, which had all sorts of consequences people hadn't expected. In the case of the British, the story of um, opening up to immigration from the rest of the, uh, from, from the former empire, which again was not fought through in any way. But, um, it seems to me that there is a common pattern in both our countries in that respect, that there is a passing of uh, a sense of white identity, mm -hmm. which is deeply troubling uh, to a lot of people. And to put it more neutrally, requires a huge effort to rethink what either country is and stands for and what it's going to do in the future and so you know if you're thinking about um you know if we're thinking about leaders trump or johnson i often say to people you know that what's significant is not leaders but followers you know why are people following these people um and one needs to understand what is the mentality that would support uh, someone like Boris Johnson, who I regard as a very you know, charismatic showman, but without um, a great deal of substance, or Donald Trump about which, you know, you will have your own views. But I mean, I think the point is not, you know, uh, Trump himself. It's why so many people supported a man who does not on the face of it have any obvious credentials to be president of the United States. Um, but that's a, that's a serious question, and that takes us into social history. One of the things, I'm answering your question again parenthetically, but one of the things, and this is nothing to do with Johnson or Trump, but it's to do with biography. Uh, Ian Kershaw, who wrote a two-volume history of uh, a biography of Hitler, um, Kershaw was a, a, you know, a social medieval, well, medieval is strong by background, social historian, and he said, I'm never, you know, I never expected to write a biography. But what he said was, I, you know, what intrigues me is why the most uh, Germany, the most um, intellectually sophisticated, culturally advanced, uh, technologically, um, you know, um, uh, brilliant country in, on the continent of Europe, why Germany fell for this total gutter mm -hmm. And that's a historical question. And I think to get into where our own countries are going, Britain and the United States, and where they've come from, one has to get in, this is where, you know, moving away from leadership history, one has to get into these larger patterns that I think are helping to explain why certain leaders capture a sort of zeitgeist at a particular time. Um, and I would have said it's, as it were, the passing of, of that sense of a clear, uh, white, if you like, Caucasian identity that is one of the things that is 
particularly problematic for a great many people. And in some ways, Johnson and, and Trump have, have caught up on. Okay. Well, thank you very much, David. I enjoyed this. And thank you, Dane. Now we're going to uh, open this up for some questions. Uh, there are a number of hands uh, that are up. Please use the raise hand feature uh, on your screen, uh, and I will try to call on as many people uh, as I can. Uh, Michelle Egan has been very um, patient, uh, and I have now unmuted you. If you could unmute yourself and pose your question, please. Michelle Egan. Uh, are you there? You need to unmute yourself. Lower left corner. <laughs> All right. Well, that's not working. So I'm going to go down the list. Uh, and uh, Michael Novak, um, I have just activated you. If you could. Okay. Very good. Oh, good afternoon. First of all, this was a very, first of all, hi, Professor Kennedy. Also, um, this was a very, this was a very interesting talk. I was so glad you could come out for this. Well, virtually. My question is actually, when the whole Brexit thing was going on, I actually knew a couple of people in school who were, Brit who were British exchange students. And I asked one of them why Britain voted to leave. And his, an and his answer after the requisite profanity was dealt with was angry, stupid old people. Now, obviously that's an, obviously that's an oversimplification, but I was wondering to like in your research and your understanding of British history, to what extent is, a gen is there a generation gap in this understanding of what it means to be British and its relation to Brexit? Yes, the, thank you for the question. The generational divide has been, I think, touched on by quite a few analysts, the sense that there was more support amongst younger British people for remaining in the European Union than the case for older ones. But there are many other divides as well. As I say, the, um, there was a much stronger support for, uh, in Scotland for staying within the European Union than there was in England. Um, a lot of, <coughs> there's been quite a bit of work done on the, uh, the correlation between support by English people for Brexit and also a low view of Scotland and uh, Scotland, particularly within the Union. In other words, that there would be a feeling that they would be very happy to say good riddance to Brussels and good riddance to Edinburgh as well, uh, in the case of many English uh, uh, supporters of Brexit. So what it opened up, I think, was a whole lot of divides in a country that had become quite complacent about its sense of um, being a, you know, a fairly happy, relaxed um, you know, we all kind of all get on with each other sort of country. And that was part of what was alarming, I think, about the, um, the sense of, of anger and division that uh, was revealed by Brexit. So generational divide, yes, but others as well. Thank you. We have a question that has come in um, to us uh, from James Banner, uh, who asks, how do you distinguish your take on the subject of the two islands from Robert Toombs's go at this subject through his English and their history. That is a work focused on England uh, as over against the entirety, entire entity known as Britain or the UK. Uh, if you look out from only England rather than from the UK on your subject, does it look any difference? different? Uh, I'm smiling because um, I don't really feel I'm on the same planet as Robert Toombs. Um, I would have said that, uh, you know, his book is a fascinating uh, book, uh, a very fascinating read, uh, but it's almost like the history of the UK with the non-English bits left out. Um, so, for example, I think the empire then is essentially, you know, regarded as an English project, which is runs right against the grain of um, you know, a lot of the scholarship about the role of the Scots and, and, and also the Irish in it. Um, 
So I'm, uh, I, I think it's a very, I don't engage, I try not to engage with uh, a lot with historiography in this book. It's a short book and I, you know, I, 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 I'm trying to write about my take on the past, but I would have said that he's doing things which I feel we ought not to be doing now. I think uh, one of the things that I found particularly important in writing the book was actually taking more seriously the history of Scotland, Wales, and Ireland, and its various, you know, the various components, parts of those countries, because there's no single Scottish story or Irish story, certainly. Um, and that, uh, that taught me a lot about myself and my own Englishness. And um, so I'm, I'm looking to, to write history in a way which challenges me as well as the reader. And um, so I wasn't uh, at all comfortable with his narrative. <laughs> we have now uh, Gavin Wright. Um, I have activated you. If you could unmute yourself and pose your question. Gavin Wright. Yes, David, can you hear me? Now we yes. can. Yes. Uh, I want to be I'd like to begin by saying hello to David Reynolds, uh, who was my host at Christ College. Uh, hi, hi, yes, a long time ago. Nice to, nice to hear from you. Uh, so thank you for the presentation, and I look forward to reading the book. Uh, I wanted to pose a question based on a lecture that I recall hearing that year at Christ College by David Canadine, which was about the theme of declineism in British politics. Mm -hmm. I'm saying it was a theme that went back more than a century. He began yes. with Joseph Chamberlain, as I recall, and went up through uh, Margaret Thatcher and saying, well, whoever's out of power is always saying uh, that the country's in decline and only I can fix it. And that it seems to have been an effective political rhetorical strategy for all that time. And then I want to pair that with uh, uh, a noted article by Barry Supple, just to mention another Christ name. Uh, also about the scene of decline, saying it goes way back, this is economic decline, mm. uh, but when you look at the growth record, it's been 2% for about as far as uh, the eye can see. Uh, now, it's true that a slow, steady growth rate of 2% will add up to relative decline, which I think is what you're pointing out, but uh, just to turn these observations into a question, uh, would you say that what we've seen over the past 25 years is basically a continuation of those themes, uh, but uh, to the point where their political bite has taken uh, uh, tragic, uh, has led to tragic uh, real world consequences? Uh, yeah, I don't think the pattern has changed. And I think the, you know, uh, you, would, uh, you would have to say that, um, while, and then this is a point David Canada has also made, that while Britain has apparently declined in the world, um, the standard of living for most British people has got better over time uh, since the Second World War. Uh, on the other hand, the benefits of uh, that affluence have not been um, uh, evenly distributed. Uh, and also, there has been this sense of uh, looking for political scapegoats to blame uh, a changing position in the world or the changing or the, uh, the, the less satisfactory position of a particular sector. So that, yes, I think that um, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the Brexit was uh, part of a political game blame game that has been going on for a long period of time and which as you say opportunist politicians have been engaged in and if we just go back for a moment to the question about statues one of the i think there's now some interesting work on why so many statues went up around the turn of the century the turn of the end of the 19th century beginning of the 20th century um that it wasn't so much celebratory, it was about anxiety. It was about that sense that actually Britain was losing its position and we needed to make sure that the, uh, the people who had made the empire, who contributed to the empire, were being uh, uh, stated and asserted as part of this effort at 
uh, willing the country on to the greater effort. So, um, you know, that would be a rather circuitous answer to your to your question. Thank you. Um, we have another question that came in um, online. Uh, this one from uh, Ari Dubnoff, uh, who writes, though historians are not prophets, would you be willing to reflect or suggest what you think would be the future of British historiography in the post-Brexit era? Will it decline? Will it focus more on empire or the opposite, island, insular, little Englander approach, or neither? Well, uh, I mean, it's a question that I think some of my um, questioners might want to contribute to as well, but it seems to me that the um, historiography is, 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 is pushed by the larger political context, but it's also driven by the particular concerns of scholars and the projects they work on. And I would suspect that there will be a large amount of historical writing that continues with the same momentum um, and the same aspirations as before, but it won't, Brexit won't necessarily change uh, the agenda. On the other hand, I do think that the sh uh, shock of the last few years has been both in terms of the of Brexit and more recently Black Lives Matter, will force people to think more um, uh, seriously, particularly about the nature of the, of the empire um, and the ways in which it's impinged on the making of Britain itself. And, and of those pro projects, of the, the issues that come up in the book, I think that's the one that I am most concerned about and most keen to see being dealt with and addressed, because it does speak, I think, most profoundly to the questions of the identity of the country, present and future. If you think about some of the other themes that I've mentioned, um, for example, the question of the United Kingdom, um, yes, at the moment it's disunited, it's been it's in some ways dysfunctional, it's not clear that that's, you know, I think that's often been the case. Um, I don't see it in the UK breaking up. Uh, I think the strains, particularly with Scotland, will be considerable, but I, I have yet to be persuaded that um, independence uh, is uh, the solution for Scotland's problems. For me, the, the, what we want is to go back to that approach of, the, of a more devolved union that was uh, outlined, if you like, in what I call the millennium, millennium's uh, settlement, de facto settlement at the turn of the century. So the issue, I think, is uh, the question of Europe is we are going to have to you know, create new relationships with the continent of Europe, whatever is said about Brexit. Brexit, although Boris Johnson wants us to feel that it all happened on the 31st of January 2020, Brexit is a process, not an event. It's going to take years to sort out our relationships with the continent, but we have to have them. But what, the question that, as I say, I feel is particularly important, and I hope more will be written about and thought about by historians younger than me and from different backgrounds to me, is that whole question of the empire and its impact on this country. Thank you. We have, let's say, a last question from Alan uh, Henriksen, who I am now unmuting. And if you unmute yourself, you can ask the question. Alan, if you could unmute yourself. My apologies. Here we go. Um, David, I have a question about what you see as being the relationship between Britain's continental connection, if you will, with the European Union and its continental connection of, via the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Uh, President Macron has spoken about the importance of Europe, the continent, I guess, being more strategically autonomous. Uh, Britain can play, I think, a role through NATO. Um, and through its developing reconnection with Europe into, into strengthening, certainly maintaining the larger, not only Atlantic, but even, even global security community. 
an Anglo spirit in that sense. And NATO, as you knew at the beginning, actually had interest through the colonies uh, in the Pacific. Um, Britain, of course, has interest in the South China Sea. Uh, it's connected with Australia and New Zealand uh, in the Five Eyes connection. It has a connection with Singapore. Um, and security, the security community, as Walter Lippmann and others argued back in the 40s, is becoming, if anything, even more important than in the past. So this might be a framework, a kind of foundation for Britain getting back into the game. What do you think? Yes, well, thank you, Alan, and um, it's nice to hear from you. Um, I, I think that one of the questions that has, um, is going around at the moment is the degree to which Britain leaving the European Union will uh, strain or weaken some of its contacts with European partners within NATO. So it has to do with, you know, some questions about the intelligence relationship, also the sharing of, of data on um, uh, criminals and terrorists and so on. So there is an ongoing question about whether, you know, moving out of one alliance uh, will have uh, implications for the, uh, uh, the other one. Um, I mean, from this vantage point, it does seem to me there's also a larger question about where the whole North Atlantic connection is going in the future. Um, and there has been a sort of feeling amongst some people that, well, if, um, uh, you know, we have problems with Donald Trump, uh, maybe when we have a new American president, uh, things will get back to, quote, normal. But there is another point of view which would say that, you know, the tra trajectory that the Obama administration started to embark on to do with thinking about, uh, as, as Hillary Clinton said, I think at, uh, at one point, you know, about a Pacific century in the future in which America's relations with China are going to be much more important, is posing major, will pose major strains for the North Atlantic Alliance in the future, particularly in a situation where there are understandable questions in Washington about the degree to which European partners are all pulling their weight. Um, <clears throat> so um, uh, I would have, um, I would be less um, confident about some of these connections than, uh, than, than others would, and perhaps your question, um, implies. I think this is going to be a challenging phase for uh, Western Europe, European Union, and its relationships with the Atlantic, uh, with the United States, uh, whether whoever is president um, from, um, from next January. And we are in overtime. And with that, I unfortunately have to draw this to a close. Uh, I want to thank Laura Mayhall, Dan Kennedy, and of course, David Reynolds for this terrific discussion. And thanks, of course, uh, to those of you who have tuned in via Zoom uh, and Facebook. This is a recorded session uh, and it is available uh, online as soon as we can post it uh, later today or tomorrow. I want to invite you all back to the Washington History Seminar in two weeks time, when on Monday, August 17th, we have a session with Anne Applebaum of The Atlantic Magazine on her new book, The Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lore of Authoritarianism. Uh, thank you to our primary speaker, our panelists, to our audience. Uh, take care and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. It's great. Good night. Bye-bye.